I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about uh, the topic of the session, which is food security. Um, and let me just highlight sort of the core point I want to make about food security. Food, obviously, literally is a question of life and death. So few questions are as important as the question of food. Um, but the main point I want to make is that when we think of food security, the core issue, uh, the structural issue, if you will, is not food per se, but is very much linked to the issues which are the theme of this conference and issues which Asma Jangir Sahib uh, uh, fought for throughout his life, which are questions of democratic rights, questions of equality of opportunity and questions of equal treatment and equal access to opportunities for all citizens of a, of a country. That, that is really at the core of uh, the problems uh, that might then lead to issues of food security. And I'll try to explain why I'm making this particular statement at the get-go. Um, when we talk about food, um, one important person historically is Thomas Malthus, who was an English economist in the late 18th century. And in 1798, he sort of uh, became famous for postulating that going forward, humanity will constantly uh, face this challenge of food crises because population tends to grow exponentially um, and so they will always bump against this barrier that they will be short of food which will then uh, constrain human population uh, human growth um, uh, going forward fortunately for us humanity malthus proved to be wrong and that i think is very important to keep in mind when we talk about food security the basic fact of global food supply is that we have abundant food, we have abundant calories available uh, given the demand that humanity uh, faces. And it is for that reason that since that uh, time, late 18th century onwards, human population has grown tremendously. And yet, because of scientific advancement primarily, uh, food productivity has outpaced uh, the demand for food. And so we have almost always been in, an, in, a, in a time when there is abundant food available. Now, when you contrast that with the question of food security, we see in the headlines, many people uh, facing food shortages and so on. The obvious answer to why humanity uh, uh, tends to face uh, uh, food security issues is that it's not a problem of uh, lack of availability of food, but it is a reflection of some deep dysfunction that the society has that people uh, uh, at times face the question of food security. Now, one person linking this to uh, democracy in particular, one person uh, who became very famous for making this point was Amartya Sen. And he pointed out that when you look at extreme uh, events such as famines, the one sort of ingredient that is critical to generate famines is a lack of democratic uh, participation in the population. Uh, so he gave the example of Bengal famine. We then found out uh, later uh, in the famous Chinese uh, famine during the Mao uh, uh, Great Leap Forward era that when people don't have a voice, uh, it is in those kind of circumstances that uh, their demand for food, so to speak, does not reach the political centers of the day, and that can lead to extreme dysfunctions in the bureaucratic setup, in the markets, and so on, that there can be large swaths of people who are not supplied the food that they obviously need and, 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 and deserve. So the question of bringing everyone's voice to the table is extremely important when we talk about solving the problem of food security, otherwise it can lead to these uh, extreme events such as famines. When we look at the question of food security in the Pakistani context, um, the basic fact again is that unfortunately, Pakistan ranks as one of the most insecure countries in terms of food. Uh, it has uh, some of the largest rates of malnutrition, stunted uh, uh, growth of children, so clearly, the question of food insecurity is a very serious one in Pakistan. What are the reasons for that? I think the basic reason is quite obvious. 
uh, to all who study this question, which is uh, Pakistan, for various reasons, has gone on a trajectory where it has adopted an unequitable growth process, where the divisions are very extremely unequal um, of what this country produces. And one way to look at that is that even when you condition, obviously Pakistan is a poor country, but even when you condition on Pakistan's GDP per capita, that is to say, even when you compare Pakistan to other countries at similar rates of per capita income, even then, Pakistan remains an outlier in terms of this question of food security. So even when we compare ourselves to countries like India, like Bangladesh, like Sri Lanka, who have similar income per capita, give or take, uh, Pakistan has a lot more uh, uh, people who are malnourished, a lot more children who have stunted growth, a lot much higher mortality uh, of under five children and so on. Um, what is the reason for that? As I've already mentioned, it's because we have fundamentally adopted a growth process that does not give equal opportunity to all. The question of food insecurity, nobody willingly goes hungry, of course. If people had enough income to support their livelihood, of course, they would buy the food. That food is available in the markets. It's available in the Pakistani market. It's certainly available in the global markets. So the reason people go hungry, the reason children go hungry is because they have not been given the income opportunities needed to sustain their livelihood. And that's a very fundamental problem that large swaths of Pakistani population face. And until and unless we level that playing field to at least some degree, um, we are not going to solve this issue. So again, I just want to highlight that the fundamental problem is not one of uh, lack of food. It is one of equitable distribution of economic opportunities. Let me now, at the very end, come to the Sri Lankan recent experience, because that is also very much related to a very a, a, a high risk that I think is underappreciated in the case of Pakistan that uh, Pakistan faces. And that is the fragility of the macro economy when it comes to exposure to potential liquidity crises. Um, just very recently, we all know Pakistan recently went into an IMF program, but it was just a hair length away from falling into exactly the same uh, uh, currency crisis that we saw Sri Lanka fall into. And if IMF had, for example, refused to uh, go into this program with Pakistan, there was no external financing available for Pakistan to meet its import needs. And of course, the most important import need for Pakistan is oil and food, two essentials without which the wheels of the economy and society would have come to a stop, and Pakistan would have had a massive uh, uh, problem with a shortage of food, medicine, and of course, energy. Uh, so just because we avoided the Sri Lanka kind of uh, situation because IMF gave us a pump up, so to speak, we should not now rest uh, thinking that this situation cannot rise again. It can very well arise and it can arise very quickly. For example, if energy prices keep going up, um, we can go back to that uh, sort of a, a situation. But certainly, even if energy prices remain uh, more moderated, the path that Pakistan has chosen in terms of the uh, economic trajectory, uh, think of the various boom and bust cycles, and I've spoken at length about these issues in the past, that uh, economic cycle that Pakistan faces periodically is the result of very deliberate policy choices that have been made in the past. And one consequence of those choices is that instead of investing in boosting the productive capacity of its people, so think about the involvement of women in the economy, which Pakistan really lacks behind, or think about the involvement of the productive side of the economy as opposed to this unproductive rent-seeking elite that dominate Pakistan's economic landscape. It is a result of those choices that have been uh, at times very deliberately made in Pakistan that we continually face these mega risks of 
not meeting our import obligations because we are not productive enough to sell enough to the rest of the world to satisfy what are our import needs in terms of energy, food, and, 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 and uh, other uh, necessities. So I just want to close on that uh, 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 hopefully important point that comes across, that Pakistan needs to change fundamentally in terms of the broader rights that we speak of. Those are very much connected to the trajectory that the economy faces. And it certainly is an important, a very important, I would say, ingredient into the, 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 the extreme uh, inequality and the in ex extreme insecurity when it comes to food that a large swath of our population faces. Let me again end by thanking the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you.